Love this podcast? Support this show through the ACAST supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. Before we get started with another great edition of the Duke Rosslyn podcast, I do want to let you know, Zencaster.com. That's right, Zencaster.com. They are, without a doubt, my favorite website to head over to for all of these great conversations that you hear on the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast. Superior quality and sound. Also, they have a great uh, video option as well if you need to record your videos. But the best part about it is the files are all split separately into MP3s. So you can edit them separately, you can put them together, do whatever you got to do. The main idea is Zencaster, Zencaster Zencaster.com, that's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R, for all of your podcasting, video conferencing, even if you just wanted to uh, have a great conversation with your loved ones. All your needs there online for communication, Zencaster has you covered. That's right. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Welcome back to Duke Loves Wrestling, the show about pro wrestling. And everything else. Let me tell you something, folks. I am all about pursuing the truth, going after the facts. Okay. And that's why I had to bring literally the guy who at this point is our most popular guest uh, of the past year. Wow. I mean, this this guy just continues to be requested. And, and that's why anytime I touch base with him, if he if he has something to say, I'm like, yeah, Rob, you, you can definitely come back because you know, the people love you, man. So without further ado, welcome back to the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast. My man, Mr. Rob the Genius. What's going on, Rob? Hey, good to be back, man. Hey, man, you're getting to a point where you're getting more popular than I am, and this is my show. What the hell's going on here, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I'll say this. Um, it's really encouraging to see, you know, some demand for, you know, the kind of conversation we have. Um, it, it really is because... Well, to be blunt, there's so much stupid talk going around every day. And sometimes you just wonder, you know, um, what, what the hell can we do here? Um, so it's it's good to see that there's some type of appetite for some, you know, intellectual conversation that's actually based in people trying to figure out what the hell really is going on and not just jumping off with narratives and this, that and the other. Um, I try very hard not to become a narrative guy and... And it's because, look, I'm, you know, I said before, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a mathematician and a scientist at heart. If somebody's throwing something out there, if you can get some information to, you know, see what the truth really is, then go after it. And the biggest thing is if the information leads you in a different direction than you were going, you got to have, you know, you got to have the courage to accept that <laughs> and, you know, and be honest with the conclusions and, you know, as I said before, sometimes there is no conclusion, and you got to be honest enough to say that. Sometimes, sometimes we just don't know, right? Um, but it's best to find out that you don't know than to pretend that you do. Well, you know, there's a whole lot of pretenders out there. They will, they will create entire stories and narratives, and you see it all the time. Um, oh yeah, people will tell you how Vince McMahon thinks. And 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 why he doesn't <laughs> like this one or how he, he he loves that one. And these are people who do not speak to Vince McMahon. Like literally, they have no right. interaction with this man whatsoever. How the hell are you going to tell the world what a man thinks when you don't even interact with that man? It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So yeah. this is when you know that sensationalism and deceiving the people is more important than actually pursuing the truth for a lot of these folk. And that's why, you know, I don't have a problem with calling them out and letting the world know that they have no integrity. I, I, I saw I saw a young guy the other day praise AEW because they allowed him to be part of a project, which is great. I think that's fantastic. And this is a guy who's in, you know, podcasting. So I guess we could say he's part of media. 
So that's great. And then he turned around and said something that I thought was really interesting. And, and, and first of all, I praise him for this because at least he's admitting the truth. At least he's making it known that there's a, a, a clear bias here. He says he gave WWE 35 years of his life and they gave him nothing. AEW's only nothing. been around for three years and they've already given him something personally. So F you, Vince McMahon. And I said to myself, bro, okay. you're part of the media. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Right. You ain't supposed to. You ain't supposed to expect, or or feel like you're entitled to the people that you cover to give you something personally. Like what? What is this? Pay to play? What is this? You know what I mean? But it, it just it, it's indicative of the attitude of a lot of these folks. These are these are fans who are trying to push an agenda, and the agenda is they believe what they like is the best thing going. And damn any facts to to conflict with that, that they're just going to push that agenda and they're going to do it under the guise of media and cut down whatever is something that they don't personally like. And for me, Rob, I just think that's crazy, because at the end of the day, if you can't acknowledge the, the, the facts, whether you like it or not, if you can't acknowledge it, then you're not credible. You know what I mean? You're 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 less than credible. You're the opposite of credible. So that's why I appreciate a brother like yourself, because regardless of how you feel, regardless of what your opinion is, you're constantly pursuing the facts. And I just I tip my hat to you, brother, because that's the way to go. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Because because uh, look, one well, one of my pet peeves is always if 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 you say something and if I can disprove what you're saying in like thirty seconds with a google search or something then I, I get really just angry about that kind of stuff because now like you're not just being you're not just deceiving people you're you basically you think we're stupid right i mean and there's so much stuff that gets put out there about you know about pro wrestling that is again you can spend 30 seconds either on a google search or you know going through some of the wrestlers social media accounts even and seeing things um you know as far as like the who who's friends with who and who hates each other's guts and all of that and you know and you can literally go through these people's social media accounts and see them hanging out together and you know the people who supposedly hate each other's guts right and you can see things like that and you know who wins enough who wins too much who's not winning enough and you can you know i guess look these same websites that i go to for information have people's one loss record. You can go see that. And I mean, you can look that up for yourself. You can look up TV ratings for yourself now. Right. I mean, and what, what I've been doing uh, over the past few weeks, I've been deep diving into the world of YouTube numbers. I did that because when Ronda, when it was announced that Ronda Rousey was coming back, there were a whole lot of people on Twitter who were basically saying that, well, well nobody wants that. Nobody wants to see that. No, you know, we don't want to see, nobody wants to see Ronda. Nobody's interested in Ronda Rousey. So that just kind of piqued my interest. Like, okay, well, let's see um, how interested, first, how interested were people in her the last time she was there? And let's just kind of keep track of how things are going and see what type of interest might be there this time around and see if that's true or not. So what do you got? What do you got? Because that's a, that's an interesting premise. And absolutely, we've heard no one's interested in Ronda Rousey or she's falling flat. Uh, she just doesn't have the same star power anymore. All this nonsense <laughs> that people are saying, which is fantastic. It's fascinating to me because, again, you personally may not like Ronda Rousey. You personally may not like uh, the presentation. Now, maybe the, the bloom is off the rose for you, but you're not indicative you're not a representative of the greater base out there that is not only aware of who ronda rousey is but is aware enough that they're interested in seeing her do something <laughs> you know what i mean whether she's wrestling right. whether she's talking whether she's wiggling her foot during an interview like i saw i saw the other day she was doing an interview with um i think it was roxy who used to be on 106 in park and Roxy said something about her. She, Ronda was barefoot in the interview, which I thought was interesting. And she said something about, oh, you got you got nice feet for a fighter. And she said, oh, thank you. She's wiggling her foot. It was one of the most popular Ronda Rousey uh, videos out there. So I'm saying to myself, well, damn, if the, if the woman could just wiggle her foot and people want to see that, 
I don't know if if this narrative about, you know, no one wants to see her is actually true. So so what do you got, Rob? What's the real deal here based on what you saw on YouTube? First, all right, just from history, like from her previous stint, she's like light years ahead of the entire women's division as far as people watching her videos and all of that stuff. Now, first, if you're wondering why I looked at YouTube view, no, videos, um, because they get paid for YouTube views. Okay. So there's a direct correlation to dollars from, okay. Um, you get, if you have a monetized YouTube account, you get paid for like every thousand views. So, and it, you know, the rate varies depends on what type of deal you have with YouTube. Um, so the more, the more views you have, the more money you make from it. And now, because there are other things that people try to throw around on, you know, when, when we talk about stuff on Twitter and whatnot, people throw around stuff like, you know, TV ratings or, you know, people throw around stuff like, well, pe- people, you know, trending on Twitter and that makes a difference and this type of thing. Um, now, like YouTube numbers, they're not the end, they're not the end all be all. And, you know, you can't just t- take that and just say that that's all you need to look at. But in, that's probably the one thing that we can actually see because Stephanie McMahon said that they have like 60 some categories that they look at for all the different wrestlers as far as to, to gauge interest level and all of that stuff. But we don't know what those categories are. <laughs> we don't. And they're not going to tell us, right? I mean, they have a whole team of data scientists, people who do this stuff full time every day. Um, they are not going to tell us what they're looking at. Uh, which of course you want, of course you're not, because that's like proprietary information. And the methodology is something the people who are doing the work that their methodology is something that they can sell to other people and whatnot. So that they're not going to just come out and tell us everything. All right. Now this particular thing is something that we can look at and that where the number actually means something, you know, if you look at if a video has a million views, it has a million views, right? It, it's like, there's no, you know, subterfuge to, to be taken from that or whatever. Right. Um, so you can look at that and if you can, you know, find like a reasonable period of time to compare people and whatnot. And which is what I did. I've, I've been looking at this stuff since Rhonda came back because I figured that was a good starting point. And you can, because the old stuff, wasn't all like it wasn't all uploaded on the same day. Some stuff has been out there for a year. Some stuff has been out there for two years, three years, four years, etc. But starting from when she came back, that's a that's a good hard starting point. You can compare stuff that's been uploaded for her since she came back. You can compare stuff that's been uploaded for everyone else since that since she came back, and you can make comparisons. Um, and. So I figured that would just be an interesting, interesting thing to do to see just where this interest level kind of lies and to see, you know, if people on Twitter are correct or not. And so what I would tell you, the short answer is that they are wrong. <laughs> okay. That's the short answer. Um, because just with my little bit of amateur, you know, statistical work here, um, it's pretty evident that uh, again just like last time she's drawn a lot more interest than basically everybody there not named roman reigns or brock lesnar um they are the roman brock and ronda are the three people who are out ahead of everyone else in terms of interest um and that's to the, i mean it, it just is and they're they're way out ahead of everyone else as far as active roster members um everyone else you know i've said this in some other conversations i've had uh, roman brock and ronda are like they drive the train everyone else is a contributor now some people contribute more than others but once you get past roman brock and ronda like i said everyone else is a contributor um they're not they're not driving the train here <laughs> okay um so she is the one and so she she's got more they they put stuff up from her that, that does millions of multi millions of views in just a few days. Okay. Um, stuff that I mean, 
the video of her returning, um, it's been up for three weeks. After, it's at 2.3 million views now. It's been, it's been, it hit 2 million views in like, probably like a week. Uh, it moved pretty fast. Um, a lot of her stuff from when she's been on SmackDown on Fridays has crossed a million views within like a day. And that's, that's pretty fast. Almost every video they put out of hers has crossed a million views. Some have crossed 3 million, some have crossed 4 million. And this is just in a m- couple of weeks. And she came back on January 29th. So she's already got videos with 4 million views, 3 million views. And that's that's a faster pace than, again, anybody not named Roman Reigns or Brock Lesnar. A much faster pace. So somebody must be liking those videos. Somebody must somebody must like her out there to be watching all of that stuff. So much to the chagrin of all of the humanoids and the, the <laughs> skinny jean wearers who need to pull up their skinny jeans and put the flavored malt beverages down. Uh, to, to their chagrin, Ronda Rousey <laughs> continues to move the needle. This is a woman with a brand that is internationally known. She's a box office draw and in multiple sports. I mean, Jesus, she was an Olympic judo player who won the bronze medal at the Olympics. Give me a break. That's before the UFC right. when she became the, the most dominant woman of her uh, era in the UFC in, in terms of being a fighter. Then she comes over to WWE and she main events WrestleMania. I mean, give me a break. This, this, is, this is not somebody who is just going to fade away. It doesn't matter. If Jimmy so and so with the with the neck beard doesn't care about Ronda Rousey anymore, the reality of the situation is the general public does. She moves the needle. She has name recognition. She has brand value, and that is why the WWE uh, brought her back. And she's producing, as you just pointed out. I mean, I believe the WWE makes somewhere around fifty million dollars a year on YouTube, so it's a revenue stream. There's no <coughs> question about yes. that. It's the it's the equivalent of what they make on some of their international uh, television um, deals there. I think in the UK, for example, they they make somewhere between 30 and 50 million dollars per year on their UK UK uh, TV deal. So YouTube is the equivalent of that. (laughs) That's a big deal. Right. That's a very big deal. Right. And And that's one of the many reasons why WWE was able to make over a billion dollars for the year last year. So. That's that's interesting stuff there on on the Rousey front there, Rob. From a general standpoint, what other stuff are you are you digging up here? Because I know that you tinker. You're you're like a guy who has an old uh, car and and he's always doing something interesting to the car to make it go faster, to make it to 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 make it sound better, what have you. You know, what other things are you tinkering with as it relates to analytical data uh, as it pertains to pro wrestling? As far as Twitter, right? How big of it, how, how much does it really matter? Right. Um, because look, I mean, with wrestling fans, there is a belief that Twitter is a big deal and that Twitter matters and all of this stuff. Right. Um, so I just, I went and I looked up just some general statistics about Twitter use. And this is, this is important. All right. Because when you, cause this is how, this is how you see just how small a bubble like wrestling Twitter is. All right. So worldwide, I look now. I look this up in a couple of different places. Um, there's somewhere between 185 and 200 monetizable users worldwide for Twitter. Okay, that means that you use it so much that Twitter can use you to get paid, basically. That they can that they can point to you as somebody who uses the platform enough that you'll see the ads and things like that, right? And they use that, you know, to sell to the advertisers to say, you know, we have this many people who use this platform enough that they will see your ads if you advertise with us. So therefore, we're going to charge you X amount of money, right? Um, somewhere between 185 and 200 million monetizable users worldwide. Okay, now there's seven billion people in the world. Okay, so 200 million mon you know, out of you know. 7 billion, what is that? That's like 2.8%. Okay, 200 million out of 700, because so 10% of 7 billion would be 700 million. We're looking at less than 10% of the population in the world uses Twitter uses and uses it enough for them to make money off of you. All right. And 75% of that is outside of the United States. 
So we're talking about wrestling Twitter. Wrestling Twitter is largely a United U.S. based thing. Okay, so we're talking a very small percentage of Twitter users that are, you know, twenty five percent of Twitter users are in the United States, and then when and that's people who talk about everything, and that's also including spam accounts, right? That 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 people use to tweet stuff out every day, right? Um, you know, like a lot of that, that Russian disinformation stuff um, that gets retweeted and all of that. Um, that's including those kind of accounts. That's including people who never talk about professional wrestling ever, right? Um, and in, in the United States, uh, that number of monetizable users is 37 million, right? Out of a country with a population is like over 300 million people. So we're talking again, less than 20% of the population that uses Twitter. And that, that's people that use Twitter for everything, right? Um, or that's, you know, that's every, every possible person that uses Twitter to talk about something. All right, we're talking less than 20% of the people in the United States. Um, and another thing I looked up, so you know, as of 2020, the top 10% of people on Twitter sent like 90% of the tweets. So we're going through this and we're just basically we're kind of whittling down and whittling down and whittling down the number of people who use Twitter to talk about professional wrestling. All right. Cause if you look at your own interactions, right. Um, how many, uh, how many people would, would you say you talk to regularly about professional wrestling on Twitter? On Twitter itself. Ooh, somewhere. I would say it's probably about 1200 people, at least somewhere around there on a regular okay. basis. And, and you're probably on the high side. I mean, people that you actually talk to, not just people who, you might see their tweets and retweeted it or something like people that you actually talk to. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's somewhere around 1200 people. I would say it's, there's, there's a lot of, of interaction uh, because you got to remember Rob, be, because I have a show, people are coming at right. me and constantly giving their opinion or, or trying to argue with me. So if it, if it wasn't for that, it would be significantly less. Um, but because I'm putting out my opinion and my assessment and the assessment of our guests and what have you, there's constant interaction about that stuff. Um, so, yeah, I'd say somewhere around 1,200 people. All right. So and you're probably on the high side because for me, it might be 100 people that I maybe talk to over the course of a week. And it's the same 100 people. It's a very small part of the entire audience. So, I mean, SmackDown gets 2 million people watching. Raw gets between depending on, you know, whether Monday Night Football is on or whatever, Raw gets between, like, 1.6 and 2 million themselves. If you've got 50,000 people who regularly talk about professional wrestling amongst each other on Twitter, considering everybody's little small circle, that's that's a that's a pretty big number altogether. Um, 50,000 out of 2 million. Um, and those 50,000 people don't all watch SmackDown either. I mean, I mean, so you're talking of s- small sliver of the people who watch SmackDown on television and also, and, and it's, it's more than 2 million. Cause remember we talked before about how, you know, ratings and stuff get undercounted and all of that. So, I mean, we're talking about a, a very, just a sliver of the people who actually watch these shows on television at, at the, at the very most 25%. And that's and that's high. Right? It's probably not that at all. So you're you're pointing that out to make the point that the Twitter audience is compared to the greater pro wrestling audience as a whole is is, is pretty small in comparison, huh? Right, and because there's this um, there's kind of one of those narratives out there is that you know the, the pro wrestling audience is only hardcore fans now because you know because well they've lost all these people over the last 10, 15 years. All we got left is hardcore fans. There aren't any casual fans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, that's not true. The vast majority of the people who watch, well, probably not on Twitter, first of all. Um, but, I mean, if, if you're talking 50,000 people who talk about this stuff on Twitter versus 2 million people who watch the show on TV, 2 million that are counted who watch the show on TV. And that's not even factoring in people who are not counted for the reasons we discussed previously. 
And then there are more people, there are people who don't watch it on TV at all anymore. They, they watch the YouTube clips. There are people who watch it on Hulu. There are people who watch another place. So when you start adding all of that up and then you compare that to the number of people who talk about it on Twitter, I mean, you're talking a, a just a small chunk of the audience. So wait a second. Are you trying to tell me that it's possible that the greater wrestling audience does not believe Tony Khan is the booker of the year? <laughs> the, the the majority of the wrestling audience doesn't know who Tony Khan even is. I mean, that's the funny thing. Like they, they yeah, um it, it's yeah, I mean the, the majority of the wrestling audience does not know who Tony Tony Khan is. They don't know they they may have seen AEW, you know, when they were flipping channels, right? And this is, and for any of those who think you might, I'm not dissing AEW for that. I'm not, that's not a diss at AEW. It's just that, you know, you know, because of the great branding job they've done over the past 40 years, when people think of professional wrestling, they think of the WWE. So yeah, the majority of the people who watch pro wrestling do not, do not watch AEW. They don't know about AEW. Um, what AEW has done a good job at is they have done they've done a good job of maxing out you know basically the people their the audience they get is they they've done a good job of maxing out finding those available people who are interested in what they do and or were just disgruntled with you know WWE um but there's a re, you know their audience being kind of where their audience numbers being what they are is a you know basically a, it's a it's a reflection of how little you know things like Twitter matter. I mean, uh, they they've managed to their credit they managed they managed to find pretty much everyone who was plugged into what they were doing and get them to watch their show. Um, they they've managed to do that. They should get credit for that. Um, there's a ceiling to it, of course. And and even in their circles, I mean, you know, I mean, again, wrestling Twitter, again, if if it's not, it's still a fraction of their audience, right? Um, <clears throat> and, you know, people find them because they're on TNT, which well, they're on TBS now, but it's still that's a prominent cable channel. Um, so it's one of the channels you can easily pass if you're, you know, flipping channels you're scrolling through channels right um so they have people who found them that way they have you know people who were dialed into the indie wrestling scene and all of that and you know, you know but i mean the, the bigger the, the the biggest thing is that twitter has a is a very small part of the audience um and it should not be taken as something you should not book your show based on what fans on twitter say <laughs> okay i mean and fans on twitter the, the loudest fans on twitter uh and that's when I said 50,000 people talking about it, I'm talking about probably like the loudest people. Uh, there are more than that who do talk about pro wrestling, but just don't talk about it that much or don't get deep into the weeds about everything. But those, you know, 50,000 or so people who are talking about professional wrestling just constantly every day on Twitter are a very small part of the wrestling fan audience. Um, because if, if they were that much, if they were that influential over the audience, then, you know, you wouldn't have had 45,000 people at the Royal Rumble. Okay. You wouldn't have had, you know, they wouldn't have done 50,000 for SummerSlam last year. Right. Because if you're to believe what you see on, in the, you know, deep diving part of wrestling Twitter, you know, every, you know, according to those folks, everyone hates the WWE and all that kind of stuff. Uh, or people just don't love it or whatever. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, the, the numbers are not there to back that up. Um, and look, just a couple of weeks ago, they, on Friday Night SmackDown, they were up against the Olympics and they did a higher number than they had done in a few weeks, uh, you know, against the Olympics. And also with a women's match in the main event of that show. Okay. Which, you know, women's wrestling is supposed to be a drag if you listen to some people, right? Um, so that shows you that, you know, the interest is there. Um, now, you know, and now of course, you know, looking at a ratings number every week does not tell you that. 
which is why, you know, with a lot of this stuff, you know, you can't, because what happens a lot of times with, with, you know, these dishonest media types is they take one number and they take a number that fits a narrative and they blow it out of proportion and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so if you, I mean, if you're going to really look at this, you got to look at, you, you got to take a broader scope, you know, and you need to look at TV ratings over, you know, several months and not one week where the number was really high or really low. Um, you got to compare, you know, you got to look at context and you know, what was it against? What was it up? You know, what were on the other channels? You know, like I said, Monday Night Football always hurts, you know, Monday Night Raw. Um, the Olympics will hurt, will hurt you. The basketball playoffs will hurt you. The NCAA championship will hurt you. You know, here's I mean, the thing that, that makes me scratch my head about the whole ratings talk, Rob, because it, I agree with you um, <coughs> overall there. But number one, we're talking about Nielsen, who right. has has been stripped of their accreditation. Right. This is a company that has done a, a very poor job of being accurate with what they're talking about, even though, you know, just despite the fact that they have a very small sample size to begin with, but it's been proven. They've had to go on record. It's a fact. They were sued by the television industry over this um, and the advertising industry. The Nielsen numbers are not accurate. They are they are low, especially as it pertains to black and brown households. And therefore, their 18 to 49 uh, numbers are just completely out of whack. They don't have an accurate way right. of measuring that. And they're still trying to figure it out. So whatever they're putting out, it's like, listen, if I if I tell you I'm going to make you a burger, but the burger is missing ingredients, right? I'm talking about the burger itself. Forget about the bun. Forget about, you know, a slice of cheese or a piece of bacon or what have you. I'm talking about the burger itself. I tell you I'm going to make you a burger and you're used to burgers being seasoned, Right. You, when you when you bite into a burger, it has a certain flavor to it because it's seasoned. At least it has salt and pepper. At least it has that. If you're dealing with somebody like us, you probably got some garlic salt. You got some onion salt. You probably got a little bit of something extra on top of that, too, to really give it some flavor. Well, if I start taking away those ingredients and then you bite into that burger, you're going to realize this ain't this ain't it. <laughs> this is not what I what I right. expected. This is not even what you led me to believe right. I was going to get, right? So right. that's that's what we have with Nielsen. But here's my issue with this whole concept of um, comparing, let's say a, a, a AEW Dynamite or even a Monday Night Raw. Well, they were they were number one this week, but you know last week they were number five, and you know and, and you know let's fast forward a week. Oh my God, they were only number nine for the night, and this is. T- Let me tell you something. Television is vast. Do you know how many television stations exist that are running? Especially during the times that wrestling are on. There was something being played on damn near every television station in existence at that time. What's my point? There's no shame in being in the top 50. There's no shame in even being in the top 100. So this this notion, and, and this is where the humanoids have been led to believe that this is a real thing. Well, they're not number one today, and they were only number five, and oh my God, you know, this this is terrible. They were only number 20 this week. Hey, humanoids, that's very good. The advertising industry is, is, is not upset about a show being in the top 25. That's not a thing. Because to be in the top 25, that's a big deal. (laughs) <laughs> it's like do you know how many other programs are on at the same time you don't think those programs get advertising revenue somebody's watching right. them so so this whole notion that a wrestling program which is such a niche product to begin with a wrestling program if it's not number one for the night then that means it failed it's the most ignorant take that we have in the discussion of pro wrestling, and you can always tell somebody doesn't know what the hell they're talking about when they start talking like that. It's like, because right. because you'll have even websites say, "Oh my God, Monday Night Raw was down twelve percent uh, compared to last year. This is the worst Raw in in six months." And in the key demo, they were down another fifteen percent, and what have you. And then I, I just ask a simple question. Based on the inaccurate numbers you're you're quoting to begin with, so let's just go by by this this inaccurate crap. 
based on that, where do they finish for the night compared to the field? Oh, well, they, they were number three for the night. And who were they behind? Well, they were behind Monday Night Football. Okay. They were number three for the night. So that means that there were only two programs that defeated them for the whole night. And those two programs were a football game, which the NFL is the most popular sport in America today. Right. So you mean to tell me <laughs> this is a failure that you've defeated everyone but football? Are you kidding me right now? Right. And then, and now look, and the starting point for, for any discussion about TV audience and all that, the starting point is that none of these shows are getting canceled. Raw, SmackDown, Dynamite, Rampage, NXT 2.0, even Impact, right? None of these people are getting, they are in no danger of getting canceled. So that is where you need to start this conversation, okay? Because once you, you, if you start there, then the ratings thing becomes almost moot anyway. Well, what it means is that whoever's talking about it doesn't know what the hell they're talking about because how can something be a failure and generate over $200 million a year in well, WWE's no, case or, or in AEW's case? They're, they're generating, what is it, around $40 million a year on this first contract? Right, and they're going to get more. In the next and they're going to get more. They, they're probably going to triple that when their next contract comes. They're and, probably going to be making at least $100 million. Yeah. Um, and Because um, um, the way it works, pro wrestling is – It is cheap to produce for TV networks and you know, the audience it brings gives you a good return on your investment. It's 52 weeks a year. There's no off season. Right. And so the comparison I've made. All right. So right now, okay. Fox pays WWE like two, 200 million a year for SmackDown. All right. For 52, you get 52 episodes, 200 million. That's $3.8 million an episode. Okay, that's what they're paying WWE. All right, now, by comparison, like the last year that Friends was on the air, each of the six principal cast members was getting paid a million dollars an episode. So by comparison, that's $6 million just to have those people on the show. Okay, that's not no production, no guest stars, and no nothing else. All right. Um, And that was, you know, that was 22 episodes you know, as opposed to 52 for, so you're, you're giving them 52 weeks of content at a much lower rate per episode than, you know, a, a hit TV show. And you sh- and you should compare it to something like friends because friends was on for 10 years. Ron has been on for what, 30 years. SmackDown has been on for over 20 years. So yeah, you, that's, those are the comparisons you make to shows like that. Okay. And, so Friends was paying six people a million dollars an episode in last season. All right. I mean, so when we're talking about cost to the TV network, that's what we're talking about here. So pro wrestling is cheap. It is cheap content, basically. And it doesn't cost the network that much. And as a result, you don't have to, you don't have to draw a bigger number because it does, you know, because it's so cheap. So I mean, SmackDown does two million on Fox on Friday nights. You know, normally, you know, if you look at like CBS and NBC and all that, their shows are doing four or five million, right? And they got to do the four or five million to stay on, right? I mean, because of cost and all of that. Um, SmackDown can do two million and is considered a big hit for Fox because it's two million people at a much cheaper price. And that's across the board for pro wrestling, okay? So... AEW is uh, however much it costs TNT. Well, they're they paying $40 million. Okay, so AEW is cheaper for TNT or TBS now than whatever else they got. You know, because they got like the NBA. Okay, so they, I mean, you know, they, AEW Dynamite is cheaper for TBS than the NBA stuff on TNT, and it's cheaper than the other stuff that they have. Uh, and you get 52 weeks of content. That's what we're talking about here. Um, you know, Impact is owned by Access TV. So, or well, the company that owns Impact, I'm sorry, bought Access TV to put Impact on there. All right. Um, and Impact does, you know, like maybe like 100,000 people, right, for an episode. But if you compare it to the other stuff that comes on Access TV, 
it's a good number. Um, you know, and Ring of Honor is syndicated, you know, through Sinclair, and then Sinclair Broadcasting owns Ring of Honor. So, I mean, so I mean, across the board, it's cheaper con. It is cheap content to produce, which is why more than you know, unless the landscape changes drastically, you know, none of these shows are in any danger of getting canceled. Or no, it's, that that's not going to happen. I mean, it, it's more likely that there may be a change with management because uh, as an example, you have a situation in AEW where they have not turned a profit and the things that they've gambled their financial future on as a company are things that are, it, it, it's either going to be hit or miss. I mean, the, the video game that they're developing, that's the reason why they're not profitable because they've sunk so much money into that. If that game doesn't sell, and I'm talking about their console game, because they've put out a couple of um, phone games, a couple of a couple of cell phone games, and those games have been dramatic failures. By the way, I don't know if a lot of folks even realize that. Uh, you probably didn't even know AEW had a had a game for uh, cell phones. But I did not. No. <laughs> that, but that tells you everything you need to know. So it, it's been a failure. <laughs> you know, their marketing has sucked. Don't even promote the games. But the games are not good either. There's been at least two, possibly three, that have been released over the past uh, 18 months that are AEW video games on cell phones, and it's all garbage. But so, so this console game, if this doesn't hit, that's a major loss, which may even threaten their ability to be profitable this year. How long is Shad Khan going to allow his son Tony to just continue to fail like this? Yeah, it's fun to pretend like you're running a business and it's fun that you get to play with your wrestling action figures that are like real life people and you get to hang out and try to act like you're, you're part of the team. And, you know, you get to party with the boys and, and all this other stuff. You get to live out your dream of having superstars be your friends, pretend friends, because you have to pay them in order to be around you. But you get the point. How long is his father going to allow him to waste money on something like that? So um, where does that put AEW yeah. if Shad Khan says, you know what, Tony, I'm not I'm not allowing you to take any more of your inheritance and sink it into this company. This is a failure. So we're going to sell it. We're going to get rid of this. We're going to unload this property because it's costing us money. It's not making us money. And it's time for you to stop trying to live glory days with this nonsense. I can see that happening. I can absolutely see that happening because it's just not a good business decision the way that they're running that company. Not to mention the fact that they don't even have a, a legitimate um, wellness policy. So, you know, what you see there and all you have to do is just take a look. What you see there is you see some numerous people who look like they have serious problems there, including in management. Right. And that's not just my opinion, <laughs> because. From from the whisper campaign that's starting to turn into a roar <laughs> coming out of that company, you got some people in that company that got some serious issues from a substance abuse standpoint, including in management. So take that for what it's worth, Tony Khan. You know what I mean? Are, are you taking a look at your team and are you setting them up for success? Are you making sure that we don't have substance abuse issues in that company, especially when you have people who are on recovery, like a John Moxley, what are you doing in that environment in order to ensure that he's being supported in the best way possible and anyone else like him? Because all I hear is that it's party time. There's cocaine, there's weed, there's Kratom. That's what I hear. I'm not there, so I'm not going to say that it's true. But when I'm hearing this from people who have been there, whether temporarily or whether on a full-time basis, that makes me wonder, right? So I could see a guy like Shad Khan, who is an actual businessman. He's an actual serious person who is seriously trying to get things done from a from a business standpoint. He's not successful all the time, but it, he, he puts in the effort and he finds a way to make a buck. AEW ain't that so far. I can see him pulling the plug on that. Well, how does that affect the wrestlers? How does that affect the company as a whole? Because, of course, I bet you WWE would, would be more than happy to pick the bones. If that company is not going to be owned by the by the Khan family anymore, you know? Yeah. And now 
because to me, like the, the behind the scenes with AEW is much more fascinating than um, what happens on screen, even because like like you know the whole thing you're talking about probability and because we you know I'm, well WWE has investor calls right so so they open the books right so we see what's going on um, with AEW it's it's very interesting because all right so now we're at this point where they're going they're going to be where they're basically starting to let some people's contracts expire and not renew them but they are also still signing people right so um you know buddy matthews you know buddy murphy debuted last night uh keith lee a couple of weeks ago you know there are some other people out there who are considered marquee free agents you know who have who would be good additions to your roster for sure um you know will they sign some of those people um who are they going to let leave you know that's going on um now, I don't go as far as to look at attendance numbers and all that stuff. Um, there are people who track that. Um, and I, now, I know that their ticket prices are a lot lower than WWE ticket prices. So the question is, there's a question of well, how much money are they making off of gate at these things? Um, you know, this, this video game thing. Um, man, that I mean, well, that's going to be a real test of their name recognition versus WWE. Because, you know, video game sales, a lot of that is name recognition. Just like people people get Madden every year, right? They say Madden sucks, but they buy the next one, right? <laughs> okay. Um, it kind of creatures a habit in that way. You know, um, and, you know, there's been a lot of positive buzz about, you know, WWE 2K22 that's about to come out. How many people are going to buy that? Well, first of all, again, name recognition. How many people who buy video games know about AEW? That's the million dollar question, right? Um, if they if if they do not have high name recognition amongst video game buyers, then that's going to be a obstacle. And then people who buy, you know, WWE Two K Twenty Two, if they're satisfied with that as a wrestling game, are they going to be that pressed to go out and buy another one? Um, you know, that's another thing. But you know, the, the question of just how much money they're making that's really the big mystery and there i mean yeah will they come up will there come a point where shad Khan, if they if they continue to not be profitable will there come a point where he just says okay enough of this um and where it's kind of a wild card is if that day comes it, it will have nothing to do with the quality of the wrestling product <laughs> by the way it'll be simply a matter of him saying you know we're, i'm done and i mean that's kind of like the sword hanging over their heads you could say and you don't know when it may never come down it may come down next year well it it all depends on tony khan's ability to to be stable as a as a leader and as an individual on a personal level if this person has uh issues with being a stable leader and a stable person that entire company is going to crumble the fact that Cody Rhodes left AEW lets you know we got some stability issues over there. You know, this guy right. leveraged his entire reputation, his family name, in order to build this company up. I'm talking about Cody Rhodes. He was as invested on a personal level as anybody in that company, and he's as responsible as anybody uh, for making that company what it is today, for better or for worse. For he to leave and to leave so soon, three years, that tells you that we got some major issues going on over there. We got some major issues. There's there's something going on with the direction of the company and the way that it's structured. There's something going on with its vision. It's not the same company that they led us to believe from the beginning, which I've been calling out since day one. And... I think that affects the bottom line at the end of the day as well, because when you prioritize a video game before you prioritize making a profit, something's wrong here. Something yeah. Wrong. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, again, it's really fascinating to see how the, how this is going to work. Uh, now I'd always figured that Cody would eventually go back to W. Well, I, I figured for a long time that he would go back to WWE, but then once he got in on AEW, I figured that, 
he was satisfied because he was pretty much getting it, it looked like he was getting what he wanted out of the deal right he had a you know he had an important spot on the card he was getting outside you know ventures going all that kind of stuff the things that he wanted to get from WWE he he, he was getting there and so it looked like to me like he was just going to stay there and then so for this to happen now it was a big shock to me and it's going to be pretty telling going forward you know just how much of a hole he's leaving because out of all the people in charge there he he's the only one that really has had a real knowledge of how to run a wrestling company right um how cuz running running a wrestling company is a very specific thing to that business right i mean to from other things it's not like running a record company or a, you know a tv network or whatever all right um it's a very specific thing Cody is the only one there who had any real education on how to do it. Uh, he And so now he's gone. And, you know, you saw like basically they, they broke out the whole political smear campaign on him last week. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, good grief. Um, you know, um, well, everybody wasn't sad to see him go. Well, I, I guess not. I mean, when, you, when you're in a high position in the company and you, you know, and you make decisions about things, of course, some people aren't going to like you, right? I mean, please. Uh, you know, I'll tell you something, Rob. The, from from what I've been told directly from people, Cody Rose is somebody that the wrestlers would go to, and he would stick up for them. Now, what's going on in that company that you need an executive to stick up for you? I wasn't going to pry that far, right. you know. But the fact that that's who Cody is to many of these wrestlers who have come through AEW, whether they're still there or not, again, that that adds to the narrative. So then when you listen to Big Swole and what she had to say about the lack of structure and the systemic issues that are going on there, and then you, you read what Sheeta had to say, where she's talking about the lack of support, which lends itself to a lack of structure <laughs> and what's going on there. You start to realize... And even with, with Daniel Bryan or Brian Danielson, American Dragon, whatever he is today, when he says things like there's too much play playing going on over there, whether that's in character or whether he's ribbon on the square, the fact still remains. This all feeds into the same narrative. You got a bunch of people who are immature. They want to play patty cake. They want to be flavored malt beverage. Cody Rose said a sports like uh, a presentation. Cody Rhodes said that, you know, things are going to matter. <laughs> like wins and losses, he had a, 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 an idea that was very much the way pro wrestling should have been, something that was more toward a legitimate sport. No one in their right mind can watch AEW and say that that's what they're delivering right now. So, of course, he doesn't fit into that whole narrative. He doesn't fit into that whole uh, scheme anymore because what he sold everybody on is clearly not what Tony Khan wants to deliver on. Now, th there's an audience for the type of wrestling product they do. And so we can't, you know, there is. How big that audience can get, uh, personally, I don't, I think there's a, you know, there's definitely a ceiling on it. Uh, because, look, I mean, just me just personally, I'm not a big fan of kick out of everything 10 times and, you know, every big match got to go 30 minutes and, you know, and then bleeding all over the place in, in some of these matches. I, I'm personally am not a fan of that stuff. Okay, well, let's, so. let's take it a step further, Rob, because we just had Dynamite last night. We saw a match, and, and you and I are both fans of women's wrestling. We, we make no bones about that. We saw a match that pitted the Bunny versus Jade Cargo, who is the what is she? What do they call it now? Is it the TBS Championship? Yes. The Bunny yeah. gave Jade Cargill two super kicks in a row. And Jade Cargill didn't go down. The super kick used to be a finish. <laughs> You're kicking this person full on in the face twice, and they don't go down. Right. So, so we got a problem there. We we have a situation where Jade Cargill doesn't move, and the bunny goes down. She doesn't move to her arm, and Jade Cargill doesn't know which arm to work next. So, so she grabs one arm, and then and then Bunny moves that arm out of the way and gives Jade the other arm. You're not paying attention. Right. 
we got a situation where the bunny pins Jade Cargill and Jade Cargill doesn't kick out when she's supposed to kick out. So the referee has to bury herself and stop herself from counting to three <laughs> when she should have because Jade Cargill's not paying attention, right? We got a situation where you have somebody like the bunny who, for the most part, has been a low-level enhancement talent. Now, she's been out there on TV, don't get me wrong, but if you look at her win-loss record, she's a low-level enhancement talent. That's how they have featured her. I remember when she was on the Indies as Cherry Bomb. I thought she had good work. I remember her stuff in Impact Wrestling. Allie, I thought she had good work. I don't know who this person is in AEW. She's had some of the worst matches I've ever seen in my life in AEW. Allie, consistently. Some of the worst matches in AEW, she's in them. Right? So you got a situation in this match where this person, who is featured the way that they should be, as essentially an enhancement talent, because that's just, they don't see, she's not delivering on what she used to be able to deliver on, so they don't allow her to win. And she's giving Jade Cargill, who is a champion, a competitive match. Are you kidding me? Jade Cargill, the most muscular, physically imposing person in the whole damn company, is having a competitive match with a glorified enhancement talent. Why is this happening? So we got a situation where they don't even want to feature women's wrestling. And it seems like the majority of the time when they do feature women's wrestling, they do everything in their power to make it look as as, as rotten as it possibly can be. And then the afterwards, you, you, you have Ty Conti come out and just like every other woman in the company for some, this must be a mandate or something, but they all got to call each other a bitch for some reason. God forbid <laughs> you have women who just treat each other like, like athletes and you can have a personal conflict with somebody without calling them a bitch. I, there's not a single word that the men call each other in that company that is consistent the way that the women all call each other bitch. It's ridiculous. Um, but you have a situation where, where, where Ty Conti comes out and she's a legitimate fighter, right? Bra Brazilian jiu-jitsu, whatever. She's a le legitimate fighter. She's getting up in Jade Cargo. First of all, she cuts a promo saying, I'm going to kick your ass. And then she runs into the ring. And gets into Jade Cargill's face. And instead of Jade Cargill kicking this small, tiny person in the in the jaw right then and there, she lets this woman get in her face. And then she gives her a kiss. And I'm just sitting here saying, what are we, what are we watching here? Right? So then the bunny attacks Ty Conti. And then Ty Conti does a move to her. And then after that, Jade Cargill decides she's going to kick Ty Conti in the face. Well, here's my question, Rob. Could we not get the message across that these two women are eventually going to have a match? The champion, Jade Cargill, the, the, the TBS champion, and Ty Conti, who's the next challenger, who she's the next up. Did we have to have that physical confrontation that made absolutely no sense? And the bunny is in there being the enhancement talent that she is and doing the worst job that she possibly could at that. It was just ridiculous, bro. Personally, I again, I I do not care for that style of wrestling. I do not personally. I mean, I have issue with a lot of where, like for example, size differentials are not taken into account between opponents. Um, I have a issue with again with the kicking out of five and six moves that should be finishers, um, and matches that have to go thirty minutes. You know, I, I personally have you know do not care for that style of professional wrestling now their fan base does their fan base likes that stuff um it's just so for me that's a, that's a, that's the thing that gets in the way of me watching it anyway because and not that they don't have any matches that i like because i very much enjoyed the match between daniel bryan and kenny omega uh, but in you know so many of their big matches it's 25 30 minutes it's Again, all of this stuff, you know, kicking out of this and, you know, and bleeding all over the place and all this stuff. And it's just stuff that just doesn't work for me. And I imagine it doesn't, you know, there are other people it doesn't work for either. And I think that does put a limit on how much, you know, business they, they can do. Um, now, as far as that, that rep, I saw the clip of the, the should have been a three count. And that's been a recurring issue there. <laughs> I mean, I've seen that multiple times in multiple matches with different people. Uh, it's it's a recurring problem um, to the point where I wouldn't even 
put that on Jade. I mean, obviously it was a mistake that she made, but it's happened. It's happened so often there in so many different matches with so many different people that clearly there's there's an institutional problem with their, you know, referees and pinfall attempts and, you know, counting and people not kicking out. Right. Um, Well, I mean, we, we got a situation where that's the head referee who, and I'm not burying Aubrey on this. I don't, I'm not blaming her because she, which would you prefer? Would you prefer a title switch that was never supposed to happen and a title switch during Black History Month for a company that already has their systemic issues? <laughs> it, 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 it literally the biggest enhancement talent that you have on the women's roster that you feature on TV. Uh, you're going to have her beat your most dominant champion. I mean, well, in, in this case, yeah, I think in this case, I will say Aubrey was right to just not count it and just it buries Aubrey. But she protected she protected the business in that situation. She protected AEW in that situation. So it's right. it's kind of it, it, it's crappy that she was put in that spot, right? Right, and but now there have been other times where it's just some random tag team match in the same situation has happened, and in that situation, then they should have just counted to three. <laughs> but um, so you just because uh, you know I know because uh, look, there are a lot of times where I know where people will look at things I say on Twitter or some things I've said on other podcasts about AEW, and basically, you know, I mean, I, I come off as a hater. Um, and honestly, for me, it's just they're not for me. And I try to speak about them honestly, about the things that you can objectively talk about. But at the end of the day, they're not for me. I don't prefer what they do. And so for me, that's always going to be the starting point, talking about them. And it's just that hasn't changed. There, I mean, there, there are some people there whose work I do like, like, like for example, like Daniel Bryan. Uh, so I will check out things that he does. But I, I absolutely cannot stand the Young Bucks. And I, I, you could not pay me enough money to watch the Young Bucks in a match. <laughs> um, you just can't. Um, and, and so as long as, you know, people like them are featured, then, you know, me becoming a watcher of what they do is just not going to be a thing. Uh, and as far as, again, it it's going to be just fascinating to see what happens with them over time because... You know, Cody's gone now. Um, you know, what's going to happen with Kenny? We don't know. Um, and I think um, with the other people there, like, again, some people are going to leave. Some people are going to stay. Some people some people are going to be allowed to leave. Um, who, you know, who makes those decisions? Well, obviously, Tony's making those decisions. But who's allowed to leave and who isn't is going to be, you know, a big sticking point as far as how they go in the future. Now, I will say, okay, but one thing, going back to the ratings thing, they're not going to get canceled, all right? If for some reason it goes south with them as a company, it will not be because of TV ratings, all right? It'll be just because shit went, fell apart on the inside. You know, with Cody leaving, you know, the, the, the curtain is starting to get pulled back a little bit now. We'll find out just how much stability he provided by being there. It, it, it at least seems like he provided a good bit of stability being there and so we'll see just how much you know over the next year or so because now he's gone uh we'll see how many if there are any more situations like with swole and you know and then you know then with what Sheeta was talking about look we'll see how those things get addressed um there are a lot of questions that they're gonna have to answer and also i mean they're, they're kind of their tv strategy uh, it, it, they continue to go with you know, building to well, basically, they, you know, they put all, all their chips on the table for these kind of big special episodes and big debuts, and just as a as a pattern, you know, their numbers spike for those things, and then they go back down. How long can you do that is a real question, um, because. By contrast, you know, I think we've talked about this before. WWE does not, they don't program that way. Um, they program to maintain a certain baseline. And then occasionally they'll do something to try and bring the number up, you know, higher than usual. But, you know, WWE is programmed, their, pro, their television programming is set up to maintain a certain baseline. And whereas AEW is set up for spikes. And, you know, again, how long is that sustainable? We don't know. Um, you know, cause 
Yeah, because I was talking about this another podcast I was uh, just on. It looks like, at least for the time being, the people the people who were unhappy enough in WWE to want to just up and leave and go there. It seems like we've run through all of those people because you know Kevin Owens resigned, Sami Zayn resigned, uh, Shinsuke resigned, AJ Styles just resigned. Right, a lot of these people who were who were kind of on that list that the internet were hoping would leave did not leave so it looks like the people who really were unhappy enough to go have gone and so it's a question of how many more out there other than people who just get released by wwe right um so the you know the big debut strategy how you know how much longer can you maintain that Uh, because i think that pool is shrinking well you can't maintain Uh, it because there's no one big out there anymore you know there's there's, there's no there's no box office draw in wrestling that exists that isn't currently already signed to WWE or AEW. They don't exist. There, there's nobody. Right. So and, yeah, there there aren't. And um yeah. that so it's a real question. Um what's that? That? Oh, so that's, that, that is a big question because now I mean um you know the chatter is now that you know Swerve is going to be coming there soon. I think he's done. I think he's he's official with oh, okay. AEW. But okay. but you know Swerve is not is not somebody that's going to set the world on fire walking in before he even wrestles a match no swerve is a guy who can who can work with anyone and if you get out of his way he's going to win people over there's no question in my mind about that but here's the problem swerve is a black man in a company that has yet to push any black men in any kind of serious fashion you know there's there's no black men who are consistently top contenders for the aew championship has a black man even won the the uh, secondary championship that they have the the TNT championship? No, so y- you're you're in a situation where you have a company that's constantly being hammered about these these uh, equitable diversity and inclusion issues. And Tony Khan's response to that is, "Well, I hired so and so." Well, who gives a damn if you hired so and so? You got a bunch of black guys in that company already. What are you doing with them? Ricky Starks is holding the title that you won't even officially recognize. If you go onto the AEW website right now, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. If you go onto the AEW website right now, they they give you the list of champions. The FTW championship is not listed as an AEW sanctioned championship. So Ricky Starks is not even featured as a as an important guy in the company in that what on that website. And that's part of the reason why he's not featured as a true contender to any of the other championships you notice that right so but ricky starks made the mistake of being born a black man what are you gonna do that's it we know tony khan he he seems to have an aversion to doing anything with any black male wrestlers and when it comes to the women he just sets them up to fail at every turn that's what i see from his work so you know and and well look keith lee is well keith lee is the no excuses signing have we seen him since he was on TV? Um, okay, so he he's been in some promo stuff the past couple of weeks. Whatever that means. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, yes, uh, uh, I'm just saying, right? And he hasn't worked. No, but well, Keith Lee is a litmus test because Keith Lee is a guy who pretty much everybody thinks WWE dropped the ball with, and you know, and I'll, I'll say that myself. I do think, I think they did. Um, that guy had a big moment in Roman Reigns. He had a big moment in Brock Lesnar. Um, you know, you, you make it work <laughs> some kind of way, and they didn't. So he's a guy that people that pe- people universally think that WWE dropped the ball with. You know, I, I got to um, say something about guy. that, Rob, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I got to say something about that. When Keith Lee and, and Roman Reigns had that stare down, there was an opportunity there for some big business. And WWE, from what I understand, and this is coming from the inside, they wanted to move Keith Lee out of NXT and up onto the main roster. Keith Lee, from what I was told, and this is from somebody on the inside, I haven't spoken to Keith Lee directly, so I haven't heard his side of this story yet, but I was told that Keith Lee turned it down, being moved up to the main roster, because at the time, his fiance wasn't getting moved up. He did not want to leave her. So he actually stayed in NXT for an extended period of time 
in order to, to be with his lady because they need to be on the same schedule and, and, and et cetera, which I, I understand that. I'm not knocking that. But I think that that was the beginning of the souring between WWE and Keith Lee. So then eventually when she gets moved up to the main roster, notice, okay, now it's time for him to be moved up to the main roster. It was like a package deal, even though they were two, doing two separate things. But again, there is, there's, there's something there with that. And then, of course, COVID happens and we got health issues and things like that. This was a missed opportunity. Keith Lee absolutely should have been champion, in my opinion. Um, but I wonder if his putting his family first – which I'm not knocking, by the way, but I'm wondering if putting his family first is a reason why they felt like, you know what, we can't trust this guy. We can't depend on this guy. We need you to, to work your career, not to work your career and her career. It doesn't work like that. So is this a, is, is this a case where both parties drop the ball with that whole run? I think so. I think based on the information I was given, again, from over on that side, I think so. So AEW definitely has a chance to right that wrong in their own way, but are they even equipped to even do it? Because we know Tony doesn't push blackmail wrestlers. So I don't know. Well, this look, this is their chance to prove everybody wrong because, you know, again, Keith is a guy who checks all the boxes. So if they're, you know, if they don't push him, now he's in that um, the brass ring ladder match at the pay per view coming up, which of course that was you know one where you know where you know our, you know Scorpio Scott grabbed the brass ring and proceeded to lose a TNT title match, and then that was the end of it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, so we'll see what happens this time. Um, but Keith has maximum name recognition with the indie wrestling crowd from his previous time there. Uh, he has some name recognition from being in WWE. He is a, so he is a guy that they have no excuses not to push. Okay. Like you, look, you can say that nobody, nobody knows who Lee Moriarty is as great as Lee Moriarty is in the ring. You know, you, you can make a marketing excuse or name recognition excuse to not push him. But so far you cannot make that excuse with Keith. Um, so they are they are on the clock, and you know if you're, if you're going to ask, well, well, how soon should they do it? You, that's for you to figure out. You're the booker, right? Um, if it means you change plans, then you do so. Because look, I, I went on record as saying they should have had Daniel Bryan beat Hangman, right? Because once you have Hang, once you have Daniel Bryan in house, then you might as well put the belt on him. He's that much better than everyone they have there. Okay. Um, so to me, and and look when the, when the Hangman story started, when they start, you know, but you know Brian was not there. Now you have him. So I, you know, I went on a record as saying they should have just had Daniel Bryan beat Hangman for the damn title because he, he's better. <laughs> okay, um, when you get better people in the house, you change your plans. Um, you know, um, and I would dare say Keith, as far as somebody you want to sell to fans or whatever. You know, Keith is a better option than Hangman, I would say. I would say Keith is a better option than Adam Cole, even, you know, in the, in the bigger picture. Uh, yeah, I would say Keith is a better option than Kenny Omega. Right? Um, he's somebody who is a better option to put out there than people you have. And, you know, and I would give them the kind of leeway that that was not the case with, like, Hobbs. Or, but you know that's not the case with Keith. All right, you got no excuse to not to not go with him. Um, so we'll see now. And they, and it shouldn't take three years, right? I mean, if you got to rewrite your plans for the end of 2022, then then that's what you should do. All right, um, as far as he goes, at least that's what I think. I mean. No, I, I agree. I agree 100%. And I, I hope that Keith Lee is in a position where he is in, in control of his destiny in that regard. Because all he has to do is show up and be who he is. You know, that's the best right. part. 
There shouldn't be anything else stopping him. There shouldn't be any politics. There shouldn't be any BS stopping him. All he has to do is show up and be available, be ready, and be willing to work. So then the focus is on Tony Khan. What are you doing, Tony? This is a thing. You got. You literally have the best prospect, the most credible person on your roster other than Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson. Um, you have somebody who's completely credible here. Why are they not? being featured as a top contender why are they not your champion <laughs> quite frankly so it'll be interesting to see what they do but you know i i i had faith in the beginning that aew would deliver because i couldn't imagine that somebody would just blatantly lie to the fan base um to that degree and unfortunately i you know they they dashed my hopes away from the very beginning and they haven't stopped so I'm at a point now where I only expect the worst from them because that's all they give me, you know, and and I want to be proven wrong. That's the best part. I want to be able to say, folks, I was wrong. They finally got it right. Oh, my goodness. This is wonderful. You know, I look at the way that they jerk around Thunder Rosa, who is one of the few credible wrestlers in the whole company. I don't understand why Thunder Rosa and Serena Deeb aren't doing a best of seven series for that AEW World Women's Championship. You're printing money. It's the easiest thing you can put together. It's the best wrestling you can put together. There's no reason why you can't do something like that, except for the fact that you have a guy in charge who's too busy playing tiddlywinks, and he's not serious about business. He wants to, he wants to uh, develop video games and sink a whole bunch of money into that as opposed to delivering the best wrestling product that he could possibly deliver. I, I just shake my head just even thinking about it. But, you know, I took you down a rabbit hole here, Rob. You know, we the, the first half of our conversation <laughs> was all about the facts. And then, you know, the, the second half, we were just shooting from the hip here. I love it, man. Why don't you let everybody know well, the best way? What's that? Oh, obviously, it's, it's, it's cool, man. You that. You know, it's, it's always fun to do that, though. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let's, let's take it a step further. What's the best way that folks can catch you out on your platforms there? Because, again, you know, people – genuinely enjoy what you bring to the table and the fact that you're somebody with credentials, you're a mathematician, you're a scientist. So you're not just speaking as some know-it-all who thinks he knows something. You actually are someone who's guided by facts. So you actually do know plenty. So what's the best way that folks can keep up with you? All right. Well, if you want to, if you want to read the stuff that I write, uh, go to robsagenius.com. And, and so my, uh, my little project, Tracking the women's matches from 2021 is pretty much a completed thing now. Uh, you can go read that, and I have another piece up where I'm, you know, going into 2022, and I'm all, and I also look at like some of the history. So that's the ongoing thing. Uh, you can you can go check that out there. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at r b o n n e one. And you can also listen to me every week on the Mindless Wrestling Podcast. Uh, I'm on there with DJ and Jason. We talk about you know mostly WWE stuff, and we do that every week. And the, those are the best ways to find me. And of course, of course, you know when I'm whenever I'm on here. His name is Rob the Genius, and that's exactly who he is. I'm sorry, Lanny Poffo, you have competition out there. <laughs> we got a real genius in the house. Rob, as always, appreciate you, brother. I always a pleasure, my man. This is Tony Schiavone, and we're desperately out of time on Duke Love Wrestling. <laughs> <laughs>